the hearts of the disciples were burning. The word of God says on the road to Emmaus, where they had been so disappointed because they totally misunderstood the crucifixion. They thought that Jesus had come to free the Jews from the Romans, only to find that he had been crucified in the most shameful and horrendous way, if you do the research, the kind of crucifixion. And so they were confused and they were sad. Some had deserted Jesus. And then he, he rose, so he, he joined them, but they didn't know it was him. And their hearts burned within them, but they didn't know it was him. When you encounter Jesus, you know many of us talk about loving and falling in love. Jesus is the only one that captures our complete heart because he made our complete heart and I'm not speaking here about your physical heart I'm speaking of your spiritual heart which is your soul so their souls burned within them and then they recognized who he was he had been abandoned by some Denied by Peter, those who he had poured into for three years, only one or two. From a distance, so no one was to associate them too much with him, stayed and watched as he died on the cross. The rest ran away. So I want to say to all of us today, that when we see the example of Jesus, we know he knows our pain of being betrayed, abandoned, forgotten, left out. And I thank God for my childhood as painful and unhappy as it was because I understand what it feels like not to have what some may have because everybody's different because when Jesus found me there was no match there was no one else who could take his place after he found me do you understand now, perhaps you may have had a happy childhood and still Jesus found you. Well, we all have to set ourselves apart even as we love people and there's nothing wrong with loving people. But you've got to get to the place where you understand that, and it's easier, I'll tell you the truth, it's easier if you have not had that kind of family support, because when Jesus comes, there's nobody to distract you. Oh, I, 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 don't want, I don't want my relationship to compete with my family because, you know, if I don't go and see them and I miss church or I don't come to, to whatever time with God, you know, that'll cause a problem in the family. When you didn't have that, it was easier to serve him. I'm not saying you can't with family. I'm saying it's easier to understand the word that says when mother and father leave you, I will take you up. Some of us were left at a very young age. So we knew there was no one else. And as life went on, no one else took his place. Or there was people and there's maybe, you know, people going to get married or they may have children no one else takes his place. That's the radical call. You don't have to be enemies with anyone. But if you're still clinging, 
for that love from others. Or if they give, it's great. If they don't, it's still great because he fills that void. That's kind of hard for some of us to understand when family and friends and church community, perhaps, I say perhaps because I have to be careful. We don't always get any love where we assume others are getting the love. But since I just, I, I want to say something here. I want to say to you that the ones who know that only Jesus can bring about that change in them, only Jesus can love them like no one else can. Those are the ones who you could threaten them with whatever. They're not budging. So one extreme, I know you all get a little weary here in Mercedes, but that's because one day you'll minister to people who were in Satanism and are out, but they're in so much bondage, they need help. When they come out, Having served Satan directly, having experienced all kinds of supernatural things, when they encounter Jesus, nobody could get them to turn back. I love ministering to them. They're desperate for him. I don't have to try and convince them about Jesus. Like, we reach that part of nothing else matters real quick. And then there are those who, in their own personal walk, have not had the experience of having the love of family and friends. And we forget that there are people like that. And so my children can't understand my journey because they had family support. So when they hear me, they don't know. I keep saying one day I have to tell them, I, how do you... T how do you tell children that have had parents loving them all their life that some of us were born, we don't know what that is. God taught us to love. So that's why not even children or husband could take the place of Jesus. There's no turning away because somebody needs more. So I'll take away what I know belongs to the Lord in order to give more to somebody. I'm not doing it. So I might end up getting stretched. But he is all I have. He is all I want. He is all that matters. And I want you to know that when we understand that, it's very easy to know what you're supposed to do on a daily basis. It's also very easy to decide how crowded out you want to be with people. Because as much as we love people, they can crowd you out. And you don't have the time. Or you get weary. By the time you start to listen to, about Jesus, you fall asleep. We spend our lives longing for relationships. And yes, we were made. Man was not made to be alone. But if Jesus is your numero uno, while you want relationships, it will not be like some... Your heart not burning for the relationship. It's burning because you are in a relationship with Jesus. I'm not here to tell you that a desire, you know, to get married you know, is something wrong. I will tell you though, we've made those desires as a replacement for where Jesus is supposed to fill. And one of the things we need to understand, and I believe it contributes to our struggle, and you may think these things are not connected, but they are connected. Um... You see, Jesus had the closest, the closest ones turn away. Yet he could still receive the Father's love and love back those who did not 
love him or at that time respond to him because they denied him. And I want us to understand that he had no bitterness. There's a connection between our desire for love from people is directly proportional to how bitter we get when they don't love us back. I just want you to pause and take that in. That's why there's so much bitterness in the church and bitterness in relationships that go sour. Our, I don't even know if I could remember what I just said. It was spirit-led. Our desire for relationships and love from people is directly proportional to when the relationships go sour, the bitterness that comes into us. I said it different because it's come from the Holy Spirit and I don't have the words. The words are not written down. Do you understand what I'm saying? So because of our desire for love and our desire for relationships, when those things don't work out and there are seasons when they will not work out, an equal amount of bitterness enters us. And what Jesus says to us is we have, he calls us to be like him, but he, it's a work of the spirit. But you've got to recognize what it is first before you go for it. You can't overcome what you won't confront. So you've got to recognize his love for people was not based on I need them. He loved us. But it wasn't a loving them because I need them. I just love them. He didn't go with them because I need them. He went to, and hung out with them because he loved them. He loved everyone, including the tax collectors and those who no one else wanted to love. But his focus remained on the Father and the love of the Father. So when he was betrayed... There was no proportion for bitterness to be in him because his focus and his desire was for the Father and to do what the Father said. And the Father, the Father's love in him flowed to others. Father is God. Jesus is God. Do you understand? Your desire for love from people and relationships with people is what causes when those relationships go sour, the bitterness to come because your focus is the people and having a relationship with them. You could love people unconditionally means no expectations. So Jesus loved unconditionally. He had no expectations. He knew what was in the heart of man, the word of God says. So he did not entrust himself. So if you have no expectations because you simply love, because love loves through you, then there's no bitterness that's going to step in. But we, some of us, we haven't gotten there yet. Because at the end of the day, we tell ourselves, well, God meant for us to expect to be loved back. There's no guarantee. We are a slave to Jesus alone. Now, you, you, you may say, I, I don't, I haven't reached there. It's okay to say that, but please, the problem with the church is that the church does not understand that's where we are called to be, at least have some direction to go in. Because your expectation that this desire to be loved back by people becomes a bitter root expectation because of bitterness that comes into us. That's an absolute parallel proportion to how much we, we, we wanted this love or we loved. Are you all understanding? So the more you love with the wrong expectation is the more the bitterness comes in when the love turns sour. 
But if you love unconditionally, nobody could turn your love sour. Your enemy could hate your back. You'll still love your enemy. You say, how? Ah, you see, it is a work of the Holy Spirit. You have to want it. If you're not there, it's okay. But if you don't want it, that's the problem. Your anger reached there. So I'm going to start off and say, first of all, if you are in Christ, part of a church community, and somebody has done you something, and all you could do is talk about them because of how, how, much, how much terrible things they did you, I'm going to make a statement here. You're in deep trouble. Because if you die tomorrow, you will go straight to hell. Because there's unforgiveness and bitterness. You see, we justify our bitterness by we loved. So why aren't we loved back? But God never said that you were going to be loved back. Perfect love has no expectations. If you're loved back, bless God. If you're not loved back, bless God anyway. Because he will love you if nobody else loves you back. You think that that is some theory in our head. Well, maybe it's still in our head. But I need you to know. We make excuses as to why we stay in bitterness with people. Well, you know, I did all this, and look at what they did. I did all that. It's okay to, 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 to go to someone mature and talk about it. Because anybody else, you might traumatize them while you're talking. Because they might be struggling with something. I'm not here to say it's okay to keep talking and talking and talking. I'm here to say a red flag should be if we continue to talk about how badly we have been treated. When only God could change that person. But he has said that he will change us from the inside. But we continue to hold on to the thing that actually defiles us. And I will tell you, I'm going back to this again today. You've heard it before, but I'm going to tell you to you in a different way because it's critical and detrimental. If nothing else you do for the rest of the year, deal with your bitter root judgments because it will take you to hell if you don't deal with it. And not only will it take you to hell, I'm going to show you how. While you busy asking Jesus for mercy and loving him, it will, I'm making up a word now, bitter up. Equal defile down the road in your life, like a poison ivy vine. So not only does it jeopardize whether you will see God's face, because the word says if you don't forgive, you will not be forgiven. But bitter root judgment goes deeper. It pollutes ahead of you. It spreads like a vine. Everything about that person that you can't stand, you're even coming across like you hate, you are literally planting seeds in your future. For the very people that will come into your life will be exactly like how that person is. What you sow, you will reap. It's a very, very serious defilement that I don't know that people are taking on because, and I just hope, I don't know, sometimes the messages you know, people may not be able to come to Tarian, but I don't know how much they go back and they listen. Probably they don't. Maybe they do. But I have to tell you, there's too much. This one upset me, so I'm not chatting with this one. And I'm not ready to talk. You don't even have to talk, but there's a, there's a freedom in your soul that even if you're not talking to the person, when you do have to say something about them, it will be 
coated in love and not bitterness. Because there are some people you may not get to talk to and you may have had unforgiveness in your heart. When, you, when that bitter root judgment is rooted out, you can talk about that person. And if, you, if, you, if, 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 if time passes, you might actually find yourself feeling love for them, the love of Christ. And you will wonder where it has come from. But it doesn't come with bitter root judgment planted. You all understand. So first and foremost, your expectation to be loved back, to be treated well. Saints, it's linked to pride. Because we feel that we ought to be treated a certain way. Because after all, is we. I mean, is me talking about how you mean? I used to do this for you. I used to do that for you. I was kind. I did all the good things. And look how you're treating me. Pride. Because if we only know how we treated Jesus before he came and drew us to himself, we won't even be able to quantify. But we don't see ourselves that way. And the same way we don't see ourselves, we see others in a distorted way. So the direct proportion to how Good we see ourselves equals how we see other people and their rottenness. We're good. They fall in far short. Day, 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 day. Saints, I have to tell you all. If you have issues in your life that you need help with and the bitter root judgment is there, you're getting cork up, constipated, it air budging. This is blocking, and it's blocking a lot of you. It's blocking a lot of you in your own relationships, among each other. I'm not saying everybody, but we need a savior, so we need to be transparent. It blocked the disciples from really understanding what Jesus did. They got it wrong, but because he had no bitterness, he could have loved them back at the same time, moments after. Once he rose, he rose and he came back. That's when he spoke to them. Three days, he could have still loved them back. We are supposed to love people back regardless. Loving back does not mean always remaining in contact. It could be a rapist and he in prison. God not telling you, go and have tea and coffee. You understand? But in your heart, in your soul, you will know. If you have bitterness. And it is because there was no bitterness in him but love that he could have continued until he went to be with the Father to go back to Peter and say, Do you love me? What do you think he was saying now? He said, Come now, it's me. You love me? You, lo you know, like how we like to be, you love me? That wasn't so. He didn't ask it so. Tell me the truth now, you love me. If you personally say, I'm not sure, you're, you're, you're depressed for a whole week. Whether they love you or they low love you back, Jesus loves you. Nobody's saying that man does not look for love, but you look for love more than you look for the love from Jesus. You are going to be disappointed every time somebody looks at you and says, No. What is there to love about you? There are some people, they will say those things. If they don't say it, they'll say it in their actions or they will talk about you behind your back. That's why it's a privilege for me to not have had the normal childhood. Not because someone with an, a normal loving family cannot serve Jesus. Of course they can. But nobody could have come to tell me that, listen, you could have some fun, you know. 
after he accepted him, it's okay, no, you could have some. Listen to me, I wanted nothing that drew me away from him. And even as a pastor, I may get a lot of criticism from some people. I wouldn't say from all. Nothing going and affect me, my relationship with Jesus and the call of God to pastor or to love or to counsel. There's nothing you could do. There's, I've told you all that. You could, listen, you could spit and I could rub it in my face. And you could go and tell my daughter I did a facial full of spit. It doesn't make a difference. If you're not careful, I'll see you the next day after God wind. And I will give you the biggest hug. You will never know. I know what you said. Because, because, because you reach a place not that you are greater. This has nothing to do with me. It is like... He loved me first. Nobody could love me so. So if they don't love me or they love me, it really don't matter. Because he loved me first. Do you understand? You need a revelation of his love. I want us to understand that the bitter root judgment, the amount of bitter root judgment that is in us equals the amount of our expectations to have been loved back by people and got disappointed. So, I want you to know, as I just share this with you, because this was not where I was going today, and then this is what the Lord does. I'll, I'd say, Jesus, help me to know what to prepare. And I'll prepare. And then just as worship is starting, or, or we go on, he's like, okay, this is what I want to tell the people today. And um, so always be prepared because it's a problem. I feel the burden. It, it's, we're not understanding the danger of bitter root judgment. I think that's what I want to say. Um, so when you read Hebrews 12, 14 to 15, that says, pursue peace with all people and holiness without which no one will see the Lord, looking carefully lest anyone fall short of the grace of God, lest any root of bitterness springing up cause trouble, and by this many become defiled. I don't know how we read a verse like this, and we still go on talking negatively and staying in that bitterness. Yes, yeah, something happened, you want to share your pain. Choose carefully because you might leave another person in pain that they can't handle. Some people can't handle stuff that you might want to share. So God will give you somebody, you share it, and then you say, okay. Okay, I'm going to Jesus now. Thank you for listening. Sometimes you get to the place, if you're like me, they have, they, it, 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 people hurt me so often. If I was to find a person to talk to, to deal with it, I would be calling people at least three times for a day. Do you understand? Some of you don't believe that, but you need to understand. When you serve Jesus, Satan doesn't like it. And he will use sometimes the very people that are part of your congregation, not mine, his. Do you understand? Some sin you have to learn, sometimes you go straight to Jesus. Okay, else you might just have to spend your whole day talking. And, and, and that's not necessary. But there are times when you do have to talk to people, make sure they're mature. But it says, pursue peace with all people. How can you read a line like that? And still be in bitterness. You say, well, I don't know how to come out of it. But the truth is, you really don't want to come out of it. Because it says, all people, even the Jacobat that affected you two days ago or three days ago, we are supposed to get help if we cannot pursue peace with all people. Now, pursue peace doesn't mean, hold my hand, I want to walk with you. But your heart needs to be healed of that bitterness. And God doesn't make any exceptions. He said, all people. And holiness, without which no one will see the Lord. That is huge. Holiness. Forgiveness. Can't see God without those two. 
looking carefully lest anyone fall short of the grace of God, lest any root of bitterness springing up causes trouble, and by this many become defiled. Looking carefully, we are called to look carefully. We are not called to be careless. We are not called to be, well, you know, I'm a Christian, but you know, this was done to me and this happened, and listen to me. Saints, get your copy book and start a write out all who did something to you and all the things that they did and look at it and say, I cannot move on until this is dealt with. But do not have these things and be going from day to day like if it's okay to carry this big load on your back all the time. Because you don't know when you will leave this earth. You will be judged. We will be judged for what we have not through Christ dealt with. Now, it's not like he's watching every, every single thing. It's not that. But at the end of the day, this breaks up our relationships. This causes um, separation. But there are those you can't necessarily reconnect with, but you could go to God. Listen, I've forgiven lots of people right there. If you call it by my bedside, wherever in my study, sitting in a chair, Forgiveness and bitterness gone up to now. No conversation with the person. There are some people you can't necessarily go to. So when you see them, your heart not going to go pop it up, pop it up, pop it up. You're not going to be like uh, 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 anger, shoot up one time. This is my tell you. The root of bitterness, fruit of anger. As you start to talk about the person, you're angry. Have to deal with it. Have to deal with it through Christ. Have to deal with it, y'all. It's going on for too long. That vine getting long, long, long. So I want us to know that we've got to stop casting stones at others who fall short of God's glory because we have also fallen. We correct people. I'll tell you about that in a moment. Nothing is wrong. Something happens, you have to tell them. But I'm talking about, but you still reliving everything, every day, whatever is done. No, you've got to go to God or you've got to go to the person and to God. Do you understand what I'm saying? Because it will keep you back, do you understand? From literally being able to love like Jesus loves. It will keep you back. I want you to know that so we've got to stop casting stones at others who fall short of God's glory because we have also fallen. And when we judge another servant or congregation of the Lord, you know like how people love to talk about churches? This, listen, I get frightened because eh? I always hear this, what they say about this church. I get nervous. I don't know if one day some of you will say to people, do you know what you all are doing? Like, I, I, because I get frightened for them. I hear it via the grapevine. I don't necessarily, the grapevine of bitterness. I hear it. But it's not said necessarily to my face. It's a very serious thing. But it has become popular to bash churches and, um, or bash another servant of God or person. But in fact... When we judge another servant, and I want to tell you what judge means, because if a tree has red or yellow mangoes, the tree has yellow mangoes, you're going to say the tree has yellow mangoes. That's not judging. I'm going to tell you what judging is. Okay, because we have to be dumb. What are we trying to say? You're seeing somebody stealing, and you're not going to say they're stealing or they're... Um, um, Oh, I think they may not be stealing. I mean, I, I see them taking things that are not theirs. But I, I, I don't believe they're stealing. Come on, that's not what it means. Okay? When we judge one of God's children, we are in effect saying that his workmanship does not meet up to our standards and that we should do better. I'm going to explain to you what judging is. Because that's what it's saying. Listen! The one with the rotten behavior is still loved by Jesus, you know. Jesus died for them, you know. We like to feel it's only us. He, God has no favorites. So you are literally starting to bash 
God's workmanship. And I'm going to show you how you can speak of something. But you've got to get help for the bitterness. But how you are called to speak when you do have a problem with a, with, with, with a situation. So, as Christians, we are called upon to judge moral issues, not people. Let me go a little deeper. When we judge the person or the character of others, he's a liar, he's a fraud, she's a hypocrite. You notice I am, I'm, I'm describing character. I'm, I'm describing the person and calling them by a certain name. We are playing God. And cords of unrighteousness will bind that person. Cords of unrighteousness bind the person judging. So let's say, if I'm saying that, I'm, I, a cord of unrighteousness binds me to the person being judged. To reap the same. I'm going to explain it to you. When you speak of people... You can say, I do not like this behavior. But when you begin to name people and call them names, do you understand what I'm saying? I don't like this behavior. Instead, you go and you call the person some kind of name. You're describing it to people. What less? He what less? His behavior shows that he is irresponsible because his irresponsible behavior but you're not calling him you're not calling you're not maligning his character but you see you can't just say that and leave it because you have to deal with this this bitterness inside and this anger that comes every time you talk about a person so you deal with behavior you do not malign character because we will be playing god and we will be binding ourselves to the person to reap what they are sowing. Because you have become connected to them with cords of unrighteousness. Because it's not the Holy Spirit operating here. You have invoked something because it's not the Holy Spirit. Just like unforgiveness, you drink the poison. Of the person who you are in unforgiveness with. With bitter root judgment. You tie yourself. Similar to unforgiveness. But I want you to know. That a root of bitterness. Will spring up like a vine or a cord. So what happens is. When we continue. To call people. Certain names. When we continue. Not to forgive. There is a root that starts... How much you're going and plant? How many seeds you plant before something starts to grow? A root grows up. The word says, lest any root of bitterness springing up cause trouble. We said before, sin is alive. Bitterness is alive. Unforgiveness is alive. It will grow up and bear and spread. So for example, when Jesus said in Matthew 7, 1 to 2... Judge not that you be not judged. For with what judgment you judge, you will be judged. And with the measure you use, it will be measured back to you. What you judge a person with, you will be judged back the same way. So, he or she is what less? Just good for, just, you know what? Probably to be homeless because they're so irresponsible. Do you understand? If you look at some of the language that David... thing is with David, he came right back and he said to God, You are sovereign. He did not stay in the bitterness by calling people... Names. He's, he, I'm not going to go to Psalm 109, but that Psalm is an example of how David was upset 
and he said, may this happen to them, may that happen. But if you notice with those psalms, they call them imprecatory psalms, he always came back and he said, you know what, God? You are sovereign. It's as if he was free to talk to God and free to come back and say, okay, God, I'm letting that go. Very different to us. You fill up somebody's ears with things and you're gone down the road and you left them with that whole language of, of negativity and all these things. You understand what I'm saying? And you do nothing about it. You have already planted seeds in them and you have planted seeds in your own self and it grows up. And you will be judged the same way. Do you understand what I'm saying? The, what judgment you judge, you will be judged. So you're busy sitting down talking about somebody. When you know they're praying, they're praying so loud. They're praying loud. You understand what I'm saying? No, you are not talking about their behavior. You're labeling them like if there's some fool, like if the Holy Spirit comes down and the Holy Spirit comes. You, people don't fear God today, you know. Imagine under the anointing of the Holy Spirit, under the anointing of the Holy Spirit, people are praying and you literally can have people in a church talking about how they don't like how they pray. Saints, break that down now. You don't like how the Holy Ghost is using that person. Saints, we've lost the fear of God. I need you to understand the word says it. The measure you use, it will be measured back to you. Proverbs 5.22 His own iniquities entrap the wicked man and he's caught in the cords of his sin. In other words, he is caught in the same cord, the same vine of the cords of unrighteousness. Do you understand the cords of sin? He's caught in it. So in the same way, a bitter root springs up and starts to form a vine and we end up being caught up in it. We become entrapped. I just want us to understand. So Paul spoke very sternly on this matter. He said, you are excusable, O man. Romans chapter 2. Whoever you are who judge. For in whatever you judge another, you condemn yourself. It has nothing to do with not saying someone's behavior is irresponsible. But that is not how we speak. We end up calling people names. Say, well, I didn't mean it. Did I? I taught recently on what you say is what affects the spiritual realm, not what you mean. The enemy is very strategic and specific. It says, in whatever you judge another, you condemn yourself, for you who judge practice the same things. So if your life has become topsy-turvy, the first thing I tell people without knowing anything is, can we please begin to deal with your, if there's bitterness towards people. No, I have no bitterness. I don't feel, I'm a Christian. Listen to me. Okay, so I don't say that because everybody, okay, there's a Christian. But if I, I say, is there anyone that you've spoken about on a regular basis in a negative way? Jesus, bring to our mind who we need to forgive. Jesus bring to our mind who we have spoken negatively about after add that on now. He will bring it to mind. It affects your own life and down the road. Depending on how you have spoken of the person and or if you do not forgive. This is a serious problem in the body of Christ. Let me give you an example. If somebody does something to hurt you, you know how you know when you're operating in unforgiveness and operating in bitterness? You can't think straight till you tell the person how you feel. Sometimes there are some things you need to hush, take to Jesus. Or you can't help, you have to talk to somebody. You must tell them how you feel about the pastor, the members, the, the cousin, the, do you understand? 
You have bitterness in your heart. You have unforgiveness. You are judging. It's like you have to get it off your chest. But what you are doing before I even talk about what it does to you, you are harming other people. You are planting seeds in them that will start to grow. And if they are not strong Christians to start off with, they are going to be led astray by you. One. Two, whether they are strong Christian or not, your opinion of that person, you are influencing another person's opinion. That's why you've got to, to responsibly, if you must speak to someone, let it be someone more mature or go to Jesus. Find a pillow and scream into it and begin to talk to Jesus. You can talk to him. Because what you might be feeling is so volatile, it will damage another person. It will lead another person astray. And if every time you talk, you have to get so angry, you need help. We said earlier that Jesus loved. That's how we know we want him to increase and us to decrease because how you love is even when you do not like something or somebody you can still speak in a way where if you talk about their behavior you can still end the sentence with however christ died for them and i need to take this to the lord but we still do that we leave other people suspended for part two when you're ready to come and have a venting session again It says here, do you think this, O oh man, you who judge those practicing such things and doing the same, that you will escape the judgment of God? This is what it says. So while we get consumed with who treated us bad, who upset us, what we do by being careless in the way we handle it, we are actually setting ourselves up for judgment. It's in the word, don't, don't shoot me. In any case, I have the armor on. It will bounce off. Go and read the Bible. Romans chapter 2, verse 1 and 3. That's what judging is. It's not saying something is wrong. Oh, don't judge. But he's wearing orange shoes. What do you want me to tell you? You can't you have to say these shoes are orange. That's not judging. But the thing is, judging is, you have already called the names. Hypocrite, this and that, whatever. God's workmanship, you have labeled or renamed. So I want you to know that this is important because God is going to hold us accountable for every word that we speak, every idle word that we speak. The word says God will hold us accountable, saints. That's why we have to take time and say, as I'm going to show you, we're not going to actually do the exercise. And those who are interested, they'll message me and I'll give them a copy. I, 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 or, or a printout of, of, of how to sit before God and say, God, bring this to my mind. And how, because the disciples asked Jesus how to pray. So nothing is wrong. We, we need sometimes to know how to do these things. The reason why it's important to do it is because any word that we have spoken, that we have not brought to Jesus and repented, we will be judged for. He says, every idle word. So while we are believing, grace extends where, because we're saved, nothing else matters. We are saved, but we will be held accountable for every idle word. And you know what an idle word is? A careless word. Now that you know how you're supposed to speak, anything other than that is careless. The sin of bitter root judgment sets s several spiritual principles in motion. First, it binds you and the person together with cords of unrighteousness. God is not in the center to redeem the situation. Again, I'll say to you all, it is saying about somebody, um, they did something wrong and you begin to talk about their character you begin to label them. You don't simply say the behavior is wrong. 
You start to call them names. I want us to understand it happens all the time. But not only that, we don't do anything about whatever the hurt is or whatever it is that we feel we've been treated badly. We leave it there. So you and the person that you can't stand, you're still tied. And that will explain why a lot of what's going on in their life and the demons that are acting up in them, you are wanting to know why you cannot settle down because you are tied to them with cause of unrighteousness through bitterness, through not forgiving, through not bringing this to God. And in some cases, we have to go to the person. We like to run away from that. You are in a family. You are in a church community. Sometimes God wants you to go to the person and say, I said this about you and I want to ask your forgiveness. We like to run away from that because we don't like to be exposed. But if you want to go one step further in obliterating Satan from in, in your midst, we need to do that sometimes. You don't have to do it every time. Because if you're like me, the amount of bad talking, I will be going to talk to people all day long. And, 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 and literally say to them, you know, you hurt me. And so, no, 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 listen. I go to Jesus most times. 99.9%. .9 and by the time he is finished with me, the love in my heart that he puts, I can't take any credit for it. I don't feel anything towards anyone who has been negative or who has maligned. It's a work of the spirit. But you have to keep on keeping on. You don't just do a one-off. You live life that way. You don't have it pack up so. And you take a little piece and then you deal with that. No, it is time now. Go before God. A lot of the issues we are struggling with in our life, we think is this. It's really linked to bitter root judgment and unforgiveness. The principle of sowing and reaping sets in motion. Galatians 6, 78 says, Do not be deceived, God is not mocked. For whatever man sows, that he will also reap. For he who sows to the flesh will of the flesh reap corruption. But he who sows to the spirit will of the spirit reap everlasting life. When your response to people or situations is such that you continue to have the bitterness that you don't want to get help for or the unforgiveness that you don't want to get help for, what you sow, you reap. Since there's a freedom that comes that nobody could give you, where you get to the place, and if you want it, he will bring you there. You have to want it. Where? While it will hurt you, nobody's saying you don't feel the pain. Trust me. I don't ever want God to take, like not have me feel pain because then my heart will be hard, right? Jesus wept. You'll feel the pain, but you will not stay in no bitterness, no unforgiveness. It's freeing. When I tell you it's freeing, like nobody could give you that freedom. Those chains can't keep you back. You're walking and you want to fly. And you're, and you're waving to the person who thought that they massacre you with the accusations or whatever they did. You, you fly and you turn around and you hug them and you're going down the road again. Nobody could keep you back. That's where you need to be and that's where you have to be. Because you cannot answer the gospel of Jesus Christ with bitterness and unforgiveness in your heart. You cannot. You love Jesus, but you don't love him enough. Because if you love him enough, you will say, I'm willing for you to somehow help me to have this bitterness removed that I can love those who do not love me back. Notice I'm not saying enemies. I'm saying those who don't love you back. I want us to know that the reaping can be a harvest that affects many people in your life. So it's not just you getting affected. If you have children and grandchildren, it's affecting them too. Because the word says in Hebrews 12, 15, by this many become defiled. So bitterness will, of bitter judgment as well, 
will defile many in your family. And that's the reason why many are not saved. Because your bitterness, your vine, of your cords of unrighteousness are spreading. So you're busy preaching the gospel and cords of unrighteousness is wrapping around your family. Saying sin is a life. So you have to ask for help if you're stuck. Don't be a Christian who, no, 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 I'm not going there. You, you feel you could say what you want about people in private. Listen, you could go to God, but you, let me lock the doors and the windows. And I think I hear, um, Pastor, pray, let there be a song barrier. Let me pray that song barrier. So nothing going out to the kingdom of darkness. And you and your friends sit down and talk bad about somebody. Sit down and feel it's okay, it's not okay. The Holy Spirit is present. You can't put up a song barrier against him. You could keep the demons out, but not Jesus. I want you to know it says here, looking carefully lest anyone fall short of the grace of God. If we reap what we sow, we could reap judgment for doing the same thing we are judging others to do, that others have done. Let me say that again. Looking carefully, lest anyone fall short of the grace of God. What is falling short? God has given his grace, and it, it going forth, and it, it passing you. It reaching just so. And you are there, and it, it reaching you. It's falling short. Because we could reap judgment for doing the same thing we are judging others for doing. That's what bitter root judgment does. Could we fall short of the grace of God? Are we extending God's grace when we judge others? And the second part of this verse is rich. Judgments can be like roots of a tree that drink from bitter waters. Judgments can be like roots of a tree that drink from bitter waters. When we are drawing bitter water through that root, Trouble will brew. The root can be seen like a vine or cord that ties each person together by the judgment separate from God. Lest any root of bitterness springing up cause trouble. That's the trouble. That's the trouble. Lots of trouble in our families. Lots of arguing. Lots of falling out. It's called bitter root judgment. The vine. The fruit of cords of unrighteousness. We have got to ask for help to deal with these things it is keeping back many of you so you might want to come to talk about i don't know um a way that you want to go deeper in prayer even wanting to counsel people you need to know how to deal with bitter root judgment and start dealing with it in your own life and i want you to know when the line says, and by this many become defiled, we do not sin in a vacuum. We are a body, a community, and then there's our families as well. If we judge, we reap that same judgment, and it can affect all those around us. So let's say someone judges a person for stealing something. Or having an affair or, 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 or doing something like that. What was, it, what was done was wrong. And a, and a leader, somebody in authority, has the responsibility to judge that behavior but not the person. You judge behavior. Do you understand the difference? Because what is happening is when we talk about the behavior, we start to hit the person. And you see the person, you can't stand the person. It's the behavior you deal with. You are feeding the dislike of people because when you talk about behavior, you really begin to hit at the person and start to call the person. And you know, you, if you know what so and so, um, this is what they did, you know. But why you have to call the name? Because you start to deal with the person, not the behavior. This is my point. But not only that, you, you say, well, I learned today to talk about behavior. So you start to talk about behavior, but in your talk about behavior, you start to infer that means that person, you know, 
So let's say you talk about a pastor. I can only talk about that. I can't talk about earlier. So you talk about, you know, she said, so I say, well, okay, that's a verb, so it's behavior, right? She said, um, pastor said, so, 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 so. And you begin to talk about what you do agree. You could talk about that, depending on who you're talking to. Because some of you are affecting new converts with your conversations. Do you understand? You in the church nine years, and you're talking to somebody here for one year, and you're busy talking about what you don't like about the message. It's your right to say you don't like something about the message. But here where we go. Here's where we go. Because you know, you know, she's a controlling person. So you know by that message, she's not only controlling, but she's, she's a hypocrite because she's preached people business from the pulpit. I'm letting you know what people like to say about pastors, okay? So I'm being transparent. I'm using myself of what some may say, hopefully not the majority. And if it is, they'll find an exchange to go to. Do you understand what I'm saying? Because I fear God too much to stand up here and preach other people's business. May he strike me down the day I ever do that. So I want you to understand, by our words describing a behavior, we start to paint a picture of the person. So you are still judging. Do you understand? Because that's how we speak. So we leave the person, not just with, well, I use the verb, she spoke, but you also throw a little thing in so that you left the person with a very poor impression of the person who spoke. So it's not just simply words. It's your motive. You cannot talk about behavior. And if you have the motive that you are trying to convince someone of how this person is a bad person, you can twist the words and become legalistic. I only spoke about behavior, but you left the person with the idea, this pastor is a rotten person or this person is a rotten person. Do you understand what I'm saying? So I want you to know that's judgment. You, 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 you're, you're starting now to stir up judgment of God on yourself. That's called bitter root judgment. So we have to be more careful. Nothing is wrong with us having certain thoughts, feelings. It's what we do with it. And I need us to know that judging the person is God's job. If we judge the person, we are playing God and getting in the way of his mercy and healing. If, yeah, if you are concerned about a leader, God needs to deal with the leader. You cannot do anything about the leader. You can pray for the leader or whoever it might be. But what you do is, if you take that route... What happens is we are getting nowhere in the church. We are getting nowhere in our families. We are getting nowhere. You are upset with someone. You feel it is your right to call them and, and vent. Or you feel it is your right to sit down and give them a speech. Perhaps your right is to go to God and pray for the person first. We have to get away from this venting scene like we can't control ourselves. We, we can't keep it in. It's called self-control. Because by the time you go to pray about the person, your, your whole perspective may be different if you still need. Because you're so traumatized in, by, by somebody, I don't know. I don't know what behavior could traumatize people, but I suppose there could be behavior. Yes, behavior could traumatize. So... Then you go to somebody. I'm trying to say that what has happened is we have become, some of us, um, what, what happens is by judging the person, we are playing God and we are blocking. If God had to have mercy and healing, we are blocking it, right? But also too, bitter roots of judgment, resentment, and accusation may form in our heart. So while we start one way and we say we are only going to deal with behavior, but we are really dropping a little tidbit, saying, I don't have to tiptoe around. All you know what I'm talking about. 
You really want to tell this person something negative about this person's character, but you're trying to do it in a holy way because you hear about bitter root judgment. So you start to talk about the behavior, but what happens is you literally have so much bitterness. What happens is there's resentment and accusation, and after that, you start to spew that out to the, act, to the person. If you only see them, it's coming out. That is a person Christ died for. Watch yourself. It don't matter if you think there's the worst person on earth. It could leak into a conversation. Because we haven't dealt with it in our heart, we're talking to somebody, and ping, the name get mentioned. You've gone down the road. Stir up. And what happens is, the conversation starts about the person. But worst of all, let's say you have judged someone for their behavior and somebody else has judged their character and called them names. I want you to understand Let's take an example. Let's take, let me give you an example. Somebody falls into adultery and you don't deal with it by talking to them about their behavior. You go down the road of gossiping about the person and you begin to call them names. Bitter root judgment are not vine that forms. You begin to hear of someone down the road falling into adultery themselves and their whole family is wrecked. That is an example of the bitter root that defiles many. You say, well, that'll happen. I promise you, if you sit down and look at your family, if you sit down and look at situations around, the very father you couldn't stand, you haven't dealt with bitter root judgment in your heart about against him. You become a father. You are going to find yourself behaving like that same father. And you want to know how. It happens all the time. You have a mother who you have bitterness against. You have not dealt with it. See, you can stop these things. You don't deal with it. You have children. And you find you are just like the mother you can't stand. You have to deal with bitter root judgment. You tell yourself you are never going to marry the way your parents married and have the spouses that they have. You, 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 you meet Prince Charming and he's Prince Nightmare. Just like if you sit, listen to me. We look at it and we say, well, it must be in our genes. No, it's in your heart. That vine continues to go and to grow. And so I want you to know, I will not have the time today to show you how to deal with this. But what I would say to you is that if you want to identify bitter root judgments, first look at some of your primary relationships. Okay? That's what I want you to do. Look at your primary relationships. Some of you... Your problem is bitter root judgment. Your problem, so let me give you an example. You have a marriage, but maybe in relationships before, there was a nightmare in the relationships. And you never dealt with how you spoke about that other person. You just know you're not in that relationship again, and you got married. You never dealt with 
all the fights you had, all the way you was treated bad, but you moved on. But you haven't moved on. The vine has moved on with you. And you marry someone, and all of a sudden, you can't believe that you're hearing the same things that you was hearing from that relationship. It's called bitter root judgment. I suggest if some of you are in bitterness from relationships, to get married right now. Let the whole premarital deal with bitter root judgment because you're going to get married and you're going to struggle just like you struggled in the other relationships. Aside from your wounded souls that need healing. Because that's a whole other story. You understand what I'm saying? So what you need to do, I'm leaving you with this. There's a whole lot more I could do. I can't do it. We don't have the time. I believe that many of us want to spend some time worshiping the Lord, but you cannot worship him in spirit and truth and not begin to deal with bitter root judgment. I would say for part two, I will show you how. What are the steps to break in bitter root judgment? How do you pray? I will pray a general prayer, but it will not be something that is very deep because you can't pray a prayer and it all goes. You've got to sit down with pen and paper, switch off the phone, and, and make a list of your primary relationships, your parents, your siblings, your spouse if you have a spouse, your children, close friends start there and you begin to ask the questions Jesus can you bring to mind if any of these people have hurt me and if I have said the words he is she is because I might have said it he is a so and so because of what he did to me she is so 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 Holy Spirit, bring to my mind if I have labeled any of these people with negative words in my life. Pause. Holy Spirit will begin to bring it back to you. Perhaps you made judgments against yourself. I will never mount anything. I will always be fat. I will never have this. Somebody told you in your life and you repeated it, you real ugly. And you said it, yeah, I real ugly. You get older, nobody could help you to believe you're really beautiful. Your cast city beauty is still always fixing, fixing. We have to deal with it because we actually can have judgments against ourselves. You can have judgment against yourself because somebody has constantly told you things and you've started repeating it and saying it and believing it. Ask the Holy Spirit to reveal any other judgments. Names of people in authority might come to mind. Begin to write these things down. You want to know? Perhaps maybe in a marriage that didn't work out, it fell apart. Go back to the first marriage if you was married before. Or go back to things that you have said in your life, even before you married this person. You may see a similarity in terms of sowing and reaping. You don't have to continue that way. Sometimes when we want, if it's in a relationship, a marriage I'm speaking of to work out, we need to deal with the bitter root judgment because it's blocking the healing in the relationship. I want you to also know that when it comes to people in authority, there are some of us, we have a problem with people in authority. So there will always be something that we will want to say about a person in authority. You all understand like there's no respect for pastors today, right? You all know even in the, in the public, you say pastor, they jump back. There's no respect. Many things have been said maligning the characters of pastors because there have been pastors that have done terrible things. But we don't stop there. We just say all of them is the same. So we begin to say these things. So you are sitting now in a church and wondering why you just can't receive what's being preached. Because bitter root judgment is acting out. 
you are actually finding yourself responding and sitting under. And if you're not careful, you may well find yourself gravitating to churches where the pastors have a lot in common from the ones that you had a problem with. That can also happen. We have to learn that bitter root judgment, bitterness, unforgiveness, sin is alive. Every time you sin, I want you to remember it's alive. Every time you speak judgment, it's alive. It's going somewhere. It's not staying stationary. So we have to stop being so careless with our words. And so as I, as I end here, I, I want to tell you that I will give you the steps to breaking the bitter root judgment in the next session, but I need us to take time. We, ask, we take a lot of time to talk about people. We do not take time to ask God to remind us, did we label people? Are there people we've labeled? Even those who we feel treated us badly, the fact is we had no right in the way we responded to speak about their character, to label them. You could speak about behavior, but if there is bitterness as well in our heart, we have to ask God to root it out because we will find ourselves literally drinking their poison and wrapping ourselves around with a cord of unrighteousness that affects our own life. So what's happening is, as I close, we want help, but we can't. We have to get cut that vine. We have to go to God and ask God to show us how to forgive. And I can show you how. You don't have to ask him. But I say this to people. Well, we have to forgive. We've taught on forgiveness Many times, you don't just sit on, I forgive, I forgive you, I forgive you. That is not forgiveness. Lord, I choose to forgive. Mary, for hurting me, for doing whatever, doing whatever, doing whatever, it made me feel. Jesus, it made me feel this way and described the way. I really felt badly, I really felt... Talk to the Lord and say, I release that person to you, Lord. Come in and heal my damaged emotions. At the same time, you sit down and you say, and when I said, Mary, people like to say things like, Mary is a potong, Mary is ugly, Mary is this, Mary is that. No, this is the kind of language. But I want you to know, I have come to know, that wherever we find ourselves where we're comfortable is where we start to vomit out things that we normally don't say in church. We do. We do. So now I come to realize that at the end of the day, um, don't assume because somebody is sitting in a church that they are applying everything that they are supposed to apply or that they know that, that they are acting on what they are supposed to act on. Number one, we come in here, we know what we're supposed to do. Some of us, when we go out, we apply it. Some of us, when we go out, that's the opportunity to talk about it, about the person, and we say things we ought not to say. In the way that I have told you, you need to deal with it. It is keeping you back. It is affecting your discernment. You are thinking you are hearing from God with some things, but the hurt and the bitterness is blocking you from hearing clearly. It is messing your life up because you are not prepared to deal with it biblically. You are trying to analyze it. I promise you, spiritual matters require a spiritual solution. You cannot logicalize it. You have got to first take the plank out of your own eye first. And then when you look at a situation, you will see it for what it really is. A lot of times we are looking at people, but we are not, we are not seeing them as God is seeing them. We're seeing them through our own 
hurt and sin. So if we continue that way, we are going to make poor choices, but we are also going to find ourselves not flourishing. So I want to say to you as I close, we've got to ask God to take the ax to those bitter roots. We've got to ask God to give us the time that he has given us, that we will, he has given us. We are just too busy. Take the time. Ask him to bring to mind those we need to forgive, but those that we have spoken about their character, labeled them, and continue to harbor bitterness in our heart towards them, figuring tomorrow we'll deal with it. It will continue to affect you. It will continue to affect your relationships. It will continue to affect your relationship with God. And you know what is the sad thing? When things happen to us, we blame everybody else. But it's really us. What's happening is the fruit of what's going on in us is what's going on in our life. I could tell you just about every problem you have. You've got to start dealing with bitter root judgment and you've got to start dealing with unforgiveness and you know how you'll know you make progress the person that really has upset you you will find a way when you see them on Sunday or whatever day after you do that exercise you're not going to love them more than everybody but you're going to be able to go up to them and say hi how are you and when you talk about, when you, when you think of them, you're not going to feel that bitterness in your heart. You know what I mean. It's, it's literally there, weighing us down. You will be free as a bird. They will have no anger, no nothing. They have no spirit of no anger to cast out. Cast out the spirit of anger. No. Root out the bitter root judgment. Bitterness, root that vine out. Begin to deal with it, y'all. Because you wait till next year, the list going to grow longer. How long you will spend? Listen, there are people, years ago, I will spend a whole day. I kid you not. The page was long, so let's work through each name. Because they wanted help to deal with it. I did this for years. Those appointments, special days for that. Two days a week. One person for one day. Maybe some for half a day. The list is long. So you wait next year, the list will get longer. God has said, we will give an account for every word we've spoken. We have to deal with these things. In Jesus' name. And so let me pray for you. Now remember, don't be like some people and you're praying and you figure because you prayed, well, that's good. No, if you have not really dealt with it, this prayer is not going to go very deep. But at the end of the day, I will tell you, when you begin to deal with bitter root judgment and unforgiveness, you will be so careful how you speak about someone's behavior. You wouldn't be talking about them anymore. And you will go to lengths not to leave anybody with any bad impression. Because that is an indirect way of maligning their character. So, in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. In fact, I want you to say this after me. It's not long. Think of the words as we say it. In the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. I confess and repent of all bitter root judgments and bitter root expectations against my father, mother, all other persons, including those I remember and I don't remember. I cancel, those are the altar could stay on the ground. I cancel every one of them. And I destroy by the finger of the living God all curses as a result of bitter root judgments in my life. 
in their place, I bless all those involved with every blessing that I can give, setting them free from all judgments and condemnations uttered by me in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. Now, if you have parents, you say this. I honor my father and mother to the extent that God's will permits in every area of my life. I cancel all inner vows. Now, inner vows are when I said I will never do this. I will never do that. Those are inner vows. I cancel all inner vows that I have ever made contrary to the will of my heavenly father. And I destroy the curses and effects, replacing them with blessings for all involved. I bring to the cross for crucifixion all attitudes, habits, practices, and consequences coming from all of the above. And I call them as dead. These are the attitudes. We call the attitudes dead on the cross when Christ died. I choose to hate all my sins enough to give them up no matter what his cost shall be according to his will and through Christ who strengthens me. I confess and repent of all wrongful judging coming from an impure heart, including blame, condemnation, anger, envy, jealousy, bitterness, all wrongful motives. I replace them with all the blessings that I can give in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. I ask God to forgive me wherever I have sown wrongful thoughts words, actions, and to spare me from reaping spare me Lord from reaping terrible things that I have sown. I forgive my father and mother and all others asking that anything of which I am not aware be brought to my mind by the Holy Spirit. I pray God's richest blessing on all who have wronged me. I cancel all parental accusation and condemnation that has taken place in my life and all bondage to people pleasing. I repent and cancel all my sinful attitudes and practices not included in the above. I replace them with the love of God and his holy will for myself and all involved. Anything not included in the above, Lord, I ask you to bring to mind in the name of Jesus. Anything not prayed correctly, Holy Spirit, correct my prayer. I ask you, Lord Jesus, to come here now. Take me, all parts of myself, into your loving arms. Show me the lies that I have believed regarding any sins done to me or which I have chosen to commit. I ask you, Heavenly Father, to replace these lies with truth, giving forgiveness, cleansing, healing, comfort, full and complete and permanent deliverance from both the lies I have believed and any and all grounds given to Satan. In the mighty name of Jesus. Father, redeem all of the above failures and preserve me 
from repeating the same. Thank you, Lord Jesus. Amen and amen. Saints, I want to tell you something. If you treat this type of situation seriously in your life, your relationships will begin to improve. Your marriages are going to make a full turn. I'm not here to tell you if maybe your spouse is not here and, you know, a miracle will occur and bring them back. I will tell you, though, the way you will discern God's will will become clearer. You will know what God is telling you to do. Your praying is going to be more powerful. Are you hearing me? The person who has done you things, you are going to find you not feeling nothing when they pass you by. When they talk to you, you're not going to bristle. You're not going to have to leave church fast so that they don't talk to you in hospitality. You are going to find yourself spiritually stronger. And you are going to find these attacks that we always blame in some witch and warlock on. It's those open doors in our life that is allowing the enemy to come in. Do you understand? I spoke to one of my disciples, counselors, who is an ex-Satanist. Now, I know some of you get a little tired. Hopefully you don't because these are the most extreme bondage, right? Woke up this morning and said to me, I want, I, no, she woke up this morning and messaged me, but I had time to message her before. The Lord said, stand your ground, do not give in to any temptation. What did she message me? And this is how I want some of you to know, where some of all you will get licked up by demons while you're waiting to deal with bitter root judgment because you have open doors. Do you understand? So when she woke up, remember she's an, ex-Satanist. What she saw in front of her, because they deal with all kind of deep supernatural, was five demons. And she knew one of her ex-handlers sent it because she, she understood five. That was his favorite number. She knew they were trying to tempt her to practice witchcraft. Because you see, when you come out of this thing, you could find yourself go right back when you give in to temptation, like how you're supposed to stop bad talking people and you go right back and the breakthrough you had last week, it, it don't amount to nothing because you went back to sin. Do you understand what I'm saying? So in her case, we're talking about um, divination. And there's these five demons and, 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 and what and saints, some of you who in time will understand that we live our Father is a spirit. God is a spirit. We live in a spiritual realm. We are spirit beings a human body. Satan has very horrible things that his agents do. So what she said to me, she messaged me. They said to her, we have come. Who would you like to send us to to torment? Now, remember, I just messaged her earlier to say, the Lord says, just don't give in to any temptation because the, the enemy provokes, just like you all, us, provokes, you understand? They just get provoked to go back to their stuff. And she, she stayed quiet. And then she said, as I've taught her, Jesus, take them away, take them to the foot of the cross, move them out of here and they disappeared why am i telling you that because perhaps some agent of satan who air come out of his satanism might have wanted to dispatch one of those demons to one of us one hour earlier and you with your bitter root judgment self have a big wide open door who would you like us to torment today Saints, we are getting mashed up because of our own sin. Jesus says when the evil one comes, he shall not find anything as he will ask Jesus. No, 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 you are setting an example for us. Deal with your stuff. 
deal with your sin. Stop blaming. You know, it's so terrible. Of course, we are in this world. We are not of this world, but they have plenty of things happening that is because of what is in us that's attracting the enemy. We, we shared this example earlier because we were singing the blood song, the blood of Jesus cover us. And I was saying, we don't even say that anymore. We got up on the morning and gone down the road. Pray the blood of Jesus over you. Pray the wall of fire. But here's what. Deal with the sin. Because you break a hedge, a viper will bite you. Stop blaming other people. Warlock, covens, this. Yes, it could be. But there are demons everywhere. And there are genders that have been sent out by agents of Satan to send stuff to the churches. To send stuff to the Christian families. To send stuff to whoever and whatever to torment them. That's what they do. That's their norm. Which cup of coffee to drink? Which one you want me to torment for you today? And she said, she stood her ground. Get away from me in Jesus' name. But the reason I'm sharing it with you all is that's their life. What is our life? Can we please stop putting off dealing with unforgiveness? Learn how to speak about people's behavior and not people. Stop labeling people. You don't like the church, don't come to the church. You don't like the person, go to Jesus and bless the person. And perhaps put some boundaries in if you want. Because you are consistently bringing judgment on yourself. Every time you see that person, you start to talk about them and how they are. So this is where I'm saying you will be spiritually stronger. If we just begin to deal with these things in our life, that really is an open door. So, so when they send out demons to torment Christians, you want to know why Christians get beat up? Because we are not dealing with the sin in us. Do you understand? Satan cannot overpower us. But he can affect us in the areas that look just like him. He has those rights. It's called legal rights. Do you understand? There's a whole other teaching which I've started on. And, and I take people through to shut those doors. We have to start with the bitter root. Judgment and unforgiveness. So Father, as we close with worship, Father, we only have a, another 20 minutes, but we are still grateful for this time. I pray that you will help us to see the importance of dealing with bitter root judgment and don't just say we can't. Father, may we get help if we are struggling, but may we set that as a goal that we have to overcome and not just leave it for tomorrow. May we understand that we are in this world, we are not of this world. God calls us as an army to walk in power and authority, but we cannot do so with bitter root judgment, with bitterness, and with unforgiveness. Father, we thank you that while there's time, you're bringing this to our mind, that we can sit and ask you to show us these areas in our life. And may we understand, oh God, that, Father, you are faithful, you are faithful, you are faithful, and we must be faithful to what the word says. No weapon formed against us shall prosper but lord help us to understand we can only say that if sin has not broken a hedge these promises are conditional all you stop praying thing and saying he who he who dwells in the secret place of the most high shall abide in the shadow of it. listen to me you're sitting on the place and praying that you're getting wap 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 you break a hedge of eye, pull bite you cannot pray a prayer like that and say well i don't pray and it got covered covered how Covered house, sin exposes. Let's deal with the sin in Jesus' name. We are not condemned. We are not condemned, but we must deal with the sin. So, Father, we thank you in the mighty name of Jesus. And Lord, we ask even as we pray, O oh God. And Father, we worship you. You have put in us a desire for bitterness to go that there will not be any more defilement of our families and the church. And that, Father, we can then truly love as Jesus loves. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.